I'd like to thank all the folks that were involved in pulling this series together. There were many, many tasks done by many, many people. But I'd like to especially thank Molly Petty. I don't know where she is. Because she did the bulk of the work. You know, you did lately. Thank you. I'd also like to thank this church, Lexington Presbyterian Church, for sharing this space with us yet again. So before our speaker is introduced, um, I want to explain a bit about the Rockbridge Water Monitors, which is the sponsor of this series. The Rockbridge Water Monitors is an independent initiative comprised of volunteers from around the community. With support from REC and the Environment, Way, Environment Committee of 50 Ways, we aim to gather data and to raise awareness about water quality in Rockbridge. The purpose of this series of discussions, it's called Troubled Waters, Building Bridges, has been to hear from speakers who, have not, who are knowledgeable about the many water quality studies done to date, and to learn from them what is known and what isn't known about the quality of our water. For example, we learned from Nesh McCray of the Virginia DEQ that in the last several decades, due to limited resources, the DEQ has only been able to monitor about 20% of our 1,000 plus rivers and streams. Of that 20%, they have designated about 60% impaired. Um, we also learned from Aaron Ling of the Virginia Household Water Quality Program of Virginia Tech that since 2008, only 215 well owners of the 15,000 in, in our county have held the, had the water in their wells tested by that program. Of that 215, 50% contain total coliform bacteria, and of those, 19% contain E. coli bacteria. Looking at this data, it's clear that the DEQ could really use some help from citizen monitors. To this end, 16 people involved in the Rockbridge Water Monitor Initiative have become trained water monitors. In August, participants received technical training from the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay on water testing methods and are now testing 16 additional stream sites on a monthly basis. The data that are record, record, recorded are recorded in local and state databases where they are available to the public and for scientific analysis. If you are interested in learning more about this project or if you have any questions whatsoever about the Rockers Water Monitor Initiative, please don't hesitate to come talk to me after the program. Um, also, on that back uh, oval table, there are a variety of um, pamphlets and sign-up sheets if you're interested in uh, other organizations and other actions involved in Water County locally. Now I'd like to ask Don Hankey to come on up and switch places with me so he can introduce our speaker for the night. Before I do that, I want one of the persons that came with the speaker to stand up. This is the better half of the family. <laughs> this is Teresa Salatin here. Say hi to Teresa. <laughs> Managing and conserving clean water on your property can be achieved in a number of ways, depending upon the lay of the land, the presence of annual streams and wetlands, and the making of sound estimates on the domestic animal carrying capacity. Our guest speaker tonight will discuss the methods and the maintenance that work on his farm to maintain Virginia state water quality standards while allowing animals and people proper access to clean water. Joel Salatin likes to call himself a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. <laughs> He's the editor of the Stockman Grass Farmer and writes the Pitchfork Pulpit column for Mother Earth News which well, just so happens to be back on the water shelf back here, the uh, December issue, the edition of Mother Earth News uh, is back there this afternoon, and uh, there's Joel on the front page. <laughs> um, he also writes numerous guest articles for Acres USA, which is a flagship <coughs> publication of the organic farming industry, and many other popular farming publications. He's an author of 10 books. He's been a featured speaker and a guest for numerous events and programs around the world, they're aimed at providing can-do methods for sustainability, ecologically sound farming practices. Joel's Polyface Farm is a vertically integrated business. It raises and processes its products all the way from its green fields in Augusta County 
to the shopping shelves and retail food outlets throughout many parts of Virginia. The farm in Swope services more than 5,000 families, 50 restaurants, and 10 retail outlets with beef, pork, poultry, and forestry products. Polyface Farm has been featured in Michael Pollan's bestseller, Omnivore's Dilemma, and in the award-winning documentary, Food, Inc. Please welcome Joel Salatin. Is this on or do I need to use this? This on? We're good? Uh, great. All right. Well, it's a real privilege. Use the mic. Use the mic? Yeah. All right. Use the mic. Here we are. Okay. Um, it's a real privilege and honor to be here. It's especially nice to be here with my, yes, my better half, Don. You called that uh, exactly right. And yeah, they say, uh, behind every successful man is one amazed woman. She's the amazed woman. <laughs> um, so... I'd like to know, as we start tonight, um, how many farmers we have? How many farmers are here? Good, 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 good. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, um, these, these things are um, sometimes tense. And uh, so I really appreciate the farmers who came out tonight so early. Uh, it's nice it gets dark early because we can then come in early, can't we? Uh, when it gets dark early. So what I want to do this evening is I want to take you through uh, some pictures. I, I think I think if I could, and I want to leave a lot of time for questions, and I'm going to discuss some of the things up here, what we call tools of the trade, that uh, that you won't see down at your local farm store. Um, but these are tools of the trade for um, for what we do. The main thing that I want to that I want to say before I go into the meat of this is. What you're going to see is a whole system. What happens is too often we focus on one thing, water or coliforms in water or whatever it may be, and, and we don't get the whole, we don't understand that it's an entire thing. You, you, can't, you can't solve stream water quality without solving the vegetation leading up to the stream. You, 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 uh, and so ecosystems are, are holistic, they're related. There's a lot of uh, interconnected parts here. And so, um, so that's why I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna show you because it's an entire system. Uh, and, and I think that too many of the programs, especially the government programs, on water quality have been have have focused on a stream, but not all of the ninety eight percent of the land leading up to the stream. And you 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 just can't do that. You, you've got it's got to be a whole landscape picture. So with that in mind, uh, so is the is the clicker working? Ah, okay. The down one is forward. Well, sure, that makes sense. Down is forward. Right. Um, you turn it upside down? Yeah, yes, I turn it upside down. Yeah, good. And am I pointing it? Where am I pointing it? Anywhere. Anywhere. Oh, wow, that's cool. Okay, so yeah, we can dim the lights. Um, so I'm going to take you on a, on a very quick, um, a quick tour here. So if you were if you were in the Shenandoah Valley 500 years ago, let's imagine 500 years ago. All right. You would have seen uh, some herds of bison that numbered maybe two million in a herd. It's hard for us to imagine what a herd of two million looks like. Um, we haven't seen those kinds of herds, but uh, they're big and and they're destructive. And uh, there were wolves, of course, coyotes, um, elk. And I think we're bringing elk back now. I'm not. I'm not 100% excited about it. Well, I'm excited about it. I'm not sure whether I'm pleased excited about it or dubious excited about it. But uh, anyway, there there was there was a lot here, and there were a lot of birds. You know, Audubon sat under a tree in 1820, and he recorded. He said he said I sat under this tree for three days, 
I'm sure he did other things, but I said under the tree. But anyway, he said three days I could not see the sun from a flock of birds flying over. They were passenger pigeons. Can you imagine a flock so big that it would block out the sun for three days? You know, and that was before and the Green Revolution and everything else. A more salad and vegetable <laughs> material than all the people in the United States today. So it wasn't, and we had two million wolves, each of whom needed 20 pounds of meat a day. So, so the food that I'm talking about was not eaten by people. Now, there, there were a lot more people here than there were when the Europeans, when Jamestown was, was formed. Um, but, there were, but, but there was a tremendous amount uh, being produced out here on the landscape. So how was this done? It was done with migratory movements. So when you study... Um, animals in nature, if you look at a nature program, if you see anything, what's the, what's the first thing you see is, is you see movement, don't you? You don't see them confined in a house. <laughs> the, the, there's movement, okay? And so a lot of what we're doing is simply trying to mimic these movement patterns, this, this, this uh, choreography of nature that occurred um, when it was more abundant than it is today. The Shenandoah Valley um, uh, suffered its greatest loss because of the plow that was able to turn over, you know, uh, Governor Spotswood, the colonial Governor Spotswood in about 1730. Uh, he had his buddies called the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe. This is pre-revolution. And the, the, um, he, was, he was concerned that these Germans and Scotch-Irish, you know, these, these non-British riffraff, were coming down from Pennsylvania into the valley and settling in behind the blue blood British. He was afraid he was going to lose control of the western Western Virginia that, of course, at that time went clear to the Mississippi, right? And so he sent these 10 buddies over to the Shenandoah Valley said, go out there, tell me what you find. And they wrote back, they said, everywhere we rode, we could take the grass and tie it in a knot above the horse's saddle. It was a magnificent silvo pasture widely spaced cathedral trees of oak and of chestnut uh, mass producing hard mass producing trees and 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 uh, uh, pastures that were maintained by fire and these huge migratory herds that would come and literally just almost plow uh, decimate uh, uh, you know an ecology <clears throat> so they're moving around so our technology to be able to duplicate this movement today is the electric fence that's the aha never before in history have we been able to put precise management to steer herbivores around the landscape to mimic what fire wolves and seasonal migrations and snowstorms and blizzards and all the other thing that, that, that moved herds before hay was made and before fences went up, okay? All those things. We can now, for the first time in human history, we can actually mimic that template better than nature so that we can put the herbivore to meet the forage at exactly the right moment. So how do we do this? We call this mob stocking, herbivorous solar conversion, lignified carbon sequestration fertilization. <laughs> and we use electric fence to confine the animals, to confine the herbivores, so that they can't just go willy-nilly around the field. They are confined by this simple little electric fence wire that puts a brake a steering wheel and an accelerator on that four-legged pruner to steer them with the same precision as you would a zero-turn mower on a golf course. That's very cool. So we can control precisely the pruning, and I'm using pruning, not grazing, because grazing has such a terrible connotation. Because whenever you say grazing, you hear people thinking overgrazing. Right? And I get it. 98% of all of the cattle in the world are overgrazing. But to try to move the conversation in a, in, a, in, a, in a different direction, 
I just quit saying grazing and I now say pruning. Why? All right, so here's the deal. That grass plant, if we want to, to sequester carbon and, and build biomass in the soil, there are three kind of plants that can take that solar energy and build vegetation through photosynthesis. Trees, woody species like bushes and shrubs, and forages, grasses, clovers, the, 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 the succulent forages. Contrary to popular belief, the most efficacious, the most efficient of those three types is forages. Now people say, oh, I, th I thought it was trees. You know, that's, that's the first. No, well, what you're seeing in trees is an accumulation of 80 years of it. But if you take your lawn clippings and you took a square yard from your lawn and you put that in a bag and you put it in a building, you know, out on the edge of the yard and you put it in there for 80 years, in 80 years, when you took those bags and you piled them on that square yard, it'd make a believer out of you. That's what I'm saying, all right? It's because the metabolism is so much faster in, in grass. I'm not going to belabor that point, just trust me. It's way faster than, than trees and things like that. That's why all of the deep soils on the planet are not under forests. They're on prairies. From the pampas of Argentina to the steppes of Mongolia uh, to the plains of America that we're still mining, with corn and soybeans, um, the, 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 the deep soils on the planet, the Serengeti in Africa, are, were all built under herbivores with perennial prairie, diversified succulent forage type um, vegetation. But this vegetation has a problem. It grows fast and it ages fast. So, you know, a, a grass plant will grow fast and then, and then it'll go into senescence pretty quickly. And it grows in an in a S curve, a sigmoid curve. Okay, you see my S here? All right. So, so I called down here this, this early part. I call that diaper grass. You know, slow. Are they ever going to get out of diaper? And then the mid part, the middle of the S, I call that teenage grass. You know, can I ever fill him up? You know, that, that time when they're growing so fast. And then off the top of the crest when it slows down, that's senescence. I call that nursing home grass. Okay? <laughs> Just to help us to visualize this growth cycle. Diaper, teenage, nursing home. Okay, so if, if, if we want to collect as much solar energy and get as much biomass on the planet's surface to intersect raindrops and to, 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 to cover the soil with, with a blanket of vegetation and all the other things that that does. Of those three stages, where do we want the plants as much time as possible. Teenage. 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 Yeah, I don't do trick questions. This is simple, okay? It's teenage, all right? So the point is that if the plant stays at diaper stage, real short, overgrazed, okay? It never gets out of first gear. Or if it's under pruned and goes out here in the nursing home in either extreme and turns brown, lignifies, and dies, in either case, photosynthesis stops. And we stop that vegetative soil cover, okay, that is so critical for maintaining um, soil building and is the key to pumping the polysaccharides and the sugars into the soil so that the little microorganisms that come along with a little pocket full of boron or a little bit of molybdenum have some sugar for their effort and they can trade in this underground cafe. I always, I always look at it like, like a Star Wars, you know, when uh, Luke Skywalker first comes looking for that fast uh, vessel, you know, to take him and he meets Han Solo in that thing and you look over there and there's this band, you know, playing, you got all these aliens, you know, whoop, whoop, you know, all these, you know weird two-headed and all this stuff. And that's the way the soil is. It's, a, it's an underground uh, a cornucopia of aliens with this, with this commerce going on. I'll trade you two molybdenums for, you know, three sugars. And, and, and that's what's going on in the soil. It's this completely, you know, and, and, and the plants are driving it. That's, that's what drives it. So, so um, the reason for the herbivore on the planet is to take this plant as it moves toward nursing home and prune it just like 
A vineyardist would prune a grapevine or an, or an orchardist would prune an apple tree not to kill it, but to stimulate new, fresh, verdant growth. Okay? That's the point. And so that's the, that's the purpose. Our tools are the electric fence. This is an energizer battery there run it. I have a solar one right here with me. We're gradually converting to all solars because the, the, the economies have changed a lot. So, so what you have is you have a, a permanent grid of electric fence and then you can come off of that Okay. You can come off of that at any time with a little um, temporary, that's the little yellow gate handle, a little temporary. And so essentially your, your, your permanents become the stringers of a ladder, if you will, and the temporaries are the rungs of the ladder. So you can, so you can, ex you, every day we're making and unmaking these rungs to give the cows one 24 hour piece of forage. So every day they get moved about four o'clock and moving them is not hard. Uh, you know, most people right here, they think moving cows every day, oh, I just could never do that. You know, um, because it, it takes too long. No, listen, if every day at four o'clock, somebody gave you a new bowl of ice cream, <laughs> along about 345, your ears would twitch and your tail would shiver, right? <laughs> So that's what happens with the cows. So this is not herding. This is called, you go out, you call them, and they just come running through. And when you move them every day like this, you can handle them very, very easily. So, so it's, it's, the, it's the herbivore that prunes and maintains this vegetative, fast-growth state of the forage so that, we, so that we're essentially running a, a, a pruning operation to stimulate verdant growth. Well, this is a field. This is in uh, late August, and uh, we were we saw the weather. It looked like the long-term forecast was a very very droughty summer. I said, oh, we better we better stockpile some forage here. So we would have made hay on it, but we said, no, nah, we better just keep some here back. And so this is um, this is a hundred cows in half an acre a day. Okay, and it looks pretty blown out there. Here it is on the left. Here it is on the right 24 hours later. Here you can hardly walk through it. Over there a mouse has to carry lunch in a knapsack to go across it. But what I want you to notice is the mulch on that. So did the cows eat it all? No, not at all. They ate about half of it, but because of the mobbing, they stomped the other half onto the soil so that the microorganisms, the mycelium, the azotobacter, the earthworms, and all that could actually get it. Because for the microorganisms, one, you know, a half an inch might as well be from here to Stanton, okay? So, so, uh, so the, it's, it's, it's the mobbing hoof action, and this is what followed, this is what follows the wildebeest. This is what followed the bison. This is, this is what it looked like. They, they made this mulch. So the animal is simply nature's pruning um, tool to move, to move the, uh, the plant base into the soil surface. So just to drive the point home, top picture is um, Cape buffalo and lions in, in uh, South Africa. Mm -hmm. And the bottom picture is cows and electric fence in Swole, Virginia. You see the biomimicry? Okay, that's the idea. Here we are two different times of the year. Top picture is February. 80 cows on half an acre a day. You see the snow hanging there on the neighbor's place. And then here we are in August with 300 head on an acre and a, and a little over an acre, about an acre and a half a day. Okay? We do make some hay. And I won't bore you with this. Hay making is hay making. It just is what it is. But this is part of the pruning process. If it gets ahead of us and we can't get around with the animals fast enough, then that excess we turn into hay. That's part of the pruning. So you can do it either with the animal or with the machine. But obviously with the machine, you wouldn't stay on there and mow it every week. Well, why do we sit there and do it every week with the cow? You see? We need, we need to get the machine off so the hay can get 
to grow. And the same thing with the, with the cow. So here, there's uh, 300 head. They're getting ready to move. You can see they're, uh, they're back where they were two days ago, then here where they are today. They're getting ready to move over here. So we simply roll up the cross fence, the port, little portable there, and they start pouring in behind, okay? So you can see here, uh, you can see where they were uh, today, where they're going in for tomorrow. This looked, that looked just like that 24 hours ago. Are you with me? Yeah. What happens when you do this? The bottom button there is a pointer. Oh, it's a pointer? Pull that down. Oh, all right. I knew it was somewhere, but I was too afraid to push something wrong and you'd have us messed up. Thank you. All right, thank you. So you can see up here, you can see recuperation where they were, you know, about three or four weeks ago. Here you can see where they were yesterday. Here's where they're, where they're going in. Um, so it's, it's moving, mobbing, and mowing. Those are, the, those are the three M's that nature exhibits in all, in all herbivorous pruning outfits in, from caribou to reindeer to giraffe to whatever. It's moving, mobbing, mowing. And if you violate any one of those three M's, you turn what is nature's soil builder, water protector, <coughs> hydration component, Organic matter builder, you turn all that into a negative. Okay? And that's the pro that's why we have Cowspiracy and the UN Long Shadow Report and the Eat Lancet Report and all that stuff is demonizing herbivores, not because herbivores are bad, because but because they haven't been handled in a naturally mimicking way. Okay? That's the that's the point. So how do we mimic nature? Um, all right, come on here. There we go. Uh, just the same, same thing, just backing up a little bit. But uh, you can see there the activity. Nobody's, nobody's pushing them. They're just, they're just coming right in uh, ahead of us. Okay. Um, easy, easy, easy to move. E the see, this is an information dense model. Okay, this is information dense. And that's what 300 head on an acre and a half looks like, okay? 24 hours. Now, water's an issue. This is not what we wanna see, okay? Uh, cows aren't potty trained. And often you'll go by this in the, and, and you'll see cows peeing in the back end and drinking in the front end. Well, if you drank out of your toilet, you probably need warmers too, right? And so, so what do we do? We put water in a pipe and deliver it to them in a simple little tank like this with a full flow valve in it that I'll show you momentarily. The reason that it's important to say a full flow valve is because many people are familiar with restricted flow valves. All these little uh, richy uh, yellow and red you know, waterers you see out in the fields that the government pays costs here for, it's got a little toilet float in it basically. And the water comes in through a little uh, a pencil sized orifice, okay, like your toilet. At maximum pressure, the most water you can get out of that is maybe 300 gallons an hour. It just doesn't come in that fast. A full flow valve is specially made so that it has a piston in it and, the, and when, the, when it opens up, the entire diameter of the feed pipe, that diameter of water can rush in there, okay? All right. So, so um, as we drill down into this water issue, I want you to appreciate now, as we, as we start looking at a whole system, when you clump up the animals like this, you can water 300 head with a little itty bitty 100 gallon water tank like this. Why? Because the herd isn't walking half a mile to water, okay? One of the reasons water becomes a problem on farms is because in a hundred acre pasture, if they're all grazing out on the backside, they're going to come to water generally as a herd. And suddenly you get 50 cows wanting to get around this trough. And uh, if you've ever stood and watched a thirsty cow drink, you know, she can put down uh, between five and 10 gallons at one, you know, at one standing. 50 cows, let's just say six gallons, 50 cows times six gallons is um, 300 gallons. And they can do that 
in about 10 minutes. Okay? So, so when, you, when you have them clumped in these tight things, there's uh, <coughs> groups, they're social, but since they're not so far away, one or two can come over to water and they're not leaving the herd. See, they're herding animals. They want to be together. Socially, cows want to be together. A, a, a cow doesn't want to leave the herd. And if you're driving them across and one happens to squirt out, you just back up a little bit and that cow's going to circle right back and they want to be in the herd. They're, they're a prey animal, so naturally they want to herd up because that's their protection from wolves and coyotes and lions and all that stuff, all right? And so, so when we have them in these small paddocks, an animal doesn't have to leave the herd to go get water. So we can now fudge on our water a lot because they're not coming as a herd, they're coming one at a time. Two at a time. Are you with me? That fundamentally changes the cost and the and, and the, the capitalization of being able to get by with simple, gentle infrastructure. This is the full flow valve, uh, as you see it in the, in the trough. Uh, the ball, when, when the ball goes down, the valve opens. When it comes up, the valve closes, of course. But um, are you having to, like, pump that water from far, far away? So, so that water, how does that water get there? So here, here's, the, here's the water line. How does that water get there? Well, it can get there by gravity or it can get there by pumping it, okay? And, uh, and, and it, 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 you can deliver water a lot of different ways, okay? Now, on our home farm, since we back up to a Little North Mountain and we have elevation difference on our farm, we're blessed uh, with elevation, so we've gone up permaculture style, if you've ever heard of permaculture, uh, which is all about um, um, intercepting surface runoff as high on the landscape as possible. The whole idea of permaculture is we want the raindrops to stay where they land for as long as possible. The faster a raindrop moves downhill, the more damaging it becomes and the less good it does. So the longer it stays where it lands, and this is, just, this is just foundational ecology, the longer a raindrop stays where it lands, the more um, advantages it offers to the landscape, all right? Now, now that can be done. So, so the best way to intercept it is with a highly organic matter spongy soil, okay? Now, before the, when, when uh, Governor Spotswood sent his Knights of the Golden Horseshoe into the valley, at that time, the average organic matter in the Shenandoah Valley was about 8%. Okay? 8%. Today, our average in the valley here is 1%. Okay? And remember, every 1% organic matter change... One to two, two to three, three to four, okay? Every 1% gives an additional 20,000 gallons of water retentive capacity per acre. So if you go from 1% to 2% organic matter, you have increased your water retentive capacity 20,000 gallons per acre. Wow. On our farm... We were 1% in 1961, like all the rest of them. Today, we're 8.2. So just say 8. And I don't say, I, trust me, I'm not saying that bragging. What I'm trying to do is give credence to the principles I'm showing that they work. What that means is that on our place since 1961, I know that's a, you know, a little ways away, but, but in this time, we have slowly moved to where now we average, we, we can hold 140,000 more gallons per acre than you could 50 years ago. Times 100 acres, 11.4 million gallons. You know, it's kind of like federal government spending, you know. I mean, a million here and a billion there, and it adds up to real money after a while, right? And so, and, and so that's the way this water thing is, all right? Uh, so if, if you start, if you start um, increasing the organic matter to where you get 
A, you get in soaked, and you all know what you know a July thunderstorm is like. I mean, sometimes we can get an inch in 30 minutes, right? You know, we, we call those toad stragglers, you know, because it comes so fast it drowns the frogs. Um, so, so you can get that, all right? And um, and so what? So our organic matter makes the ground spongy, so that that can soak in. You know, one of the best things we can do to determine if our landscape is resilient is how fast does it take in water? How, how fast can, can, can it absorb water? Now, when that is full, when that is full, then what? Then we get surface runoff, okay? So when we get surface runoff, if we get enough surface runoff, what happens downstream? A flood, flood. right? Okay, so... There was an Australian engineer in 1950 who developed a system called the Key Line System, but, but he wrote a book, uh, Water for Every Farm, in about 1950, and he's still considered the guru of water worldwide. P.A. Yeomans was his name. And um, he wrote Water for Every Farm, and he said every farm should aspire to two things. Number one is to eliminate surface runoff, and number two is to never end a drought uh, with a full pond. So, we have built numerous ponds up on high ground um, in, in valleys, and you just locate them. Here's the, other, here's the other rule. So we talked about runoff. The other cool thing, so can I, remember the gallons I said, 1% increase in organic matter is how many gallons of retention? 20,000. Okay. So here's the other one, and you got to keep these two separate. They're, but, but, but they're close enough, it's fascinating, the two of them. So, one acre inch of water, so that's an inch on an acre. And what's an acre? About a football field. So imagine one inch of water, are you with me? On a football field, okay? That's 30,000 gallons. 30,000 gallons. So if you have just a five acre watershed, which you farmers that are here, you know when I say a five acre watershed, that's nothing. I mean, many of us have... 40 acre, even 100 acre, you know, <clears throat> comes down, right? But even a five acre watershed, if we have, let's just say we have six, make this simple, six events in a year where an inch of water comes off. Maybe it's the backside of a hurricane that comes up in August, right? And we get three inches of rain in a day. That often happens. Uh, maybe uh, normally it's uh, January, February in a snow melt. You know, when water's running everywhere. Are you, everybody's, uh, you know, sometimes water runs everywhere. Are you with me? All right, those are what we call water events. If we have six of those a year at one inch apiece, that's six inches off of five acres, all right, is six times 30,000 is 180,000 times five acres is 900,000 gallons of water off of a five acre watershed. And that's, that's common here. It's very common here. My point is, folks, we got water up the wazoo. <laughs> the problem is we're not keeping it. Okay, We're not keeping it. We're not utilizing it. And you know what's interesting? That same thing is true in Australia, Utah, New Mexico, Nevada. You drive up through um, uh, New Mexico, Los Alamos, uh, you know, up there, Albuquerque. And, and, and every two miles on the interstate, there's this huge, goodness, it's as wide as this room almost. Maybe not quite as wide. An, an arroyo, arroyo, they call it, you know. And, and of course, the, 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 the sand rails and the dune buggies, you know, they, they use them to run up and down and... Have fun. But you ask your host or hostess, what are those for? Are those for dune buggy? Oh, no, no, no. Five to eight times a year, those things are running full to the banks with water. The point is that if we actually put ponds in our landscape, Lewis Bromfield wrote about this in 1950 with Valabar Farm and Out of the Earth. Um, and he said, he said at that time, he said that this, this is before a lot of the uh, dams were put in on the Mississippi to control flooding. He said, the problem with flooding on the Mississippi has nothing to do 
with big dams on the Mississippi. We need millions of farm ponds, like 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 uh, like a big like a big uh, cow footprint. Imagine, you know, on the landscape in the entire Ohio Valley. He said we wouldn't have any problems on the Mississippi if you wait until the water develops the volume and the velocity. By the time it gets to the Mississippi, you you can't control it. Okay, what you want to do is you want to control it when it's real tiny, when it's a little, a little, you know, uh, rivulet. Okay, coming off a off a valley, off a off a gully. All right, and so so um, on our place, we have built a bunch of these ponds, and and by gravity, because we're up, you know, we've got some high ground. By gravity, we run this whole system, and we have seventy psi water over an eight mile waterline grid. Okay, you say, well, I thought water came from a well. Okay, so trust me tonight, everything that I'm going to show you is contrary to almost every government granting process for ecology. Okay, the reason the government doesn't like ponds, and interestingly, in the 1950s, the old Soil Conservation Service, which is now the renamed Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, the Old Soil Conservation Service in the 50s used to cost share pond building all the time. Today, they'd like to destroy them all because since the 1950s, we've had a buildup of the vertically integrated poultry industry, which is scared to death of migratory waterfowl for avian flu. And so now ponds are viewed as a liability and not an asset. Okay, and so that's why the government wants to either pull water from a river, a spring, a creek, or drill a well. The problem with all those sources, I want you to follow me here philosophically. The problem with all those is, those are the commons. You didn't put that spring there. You didn't put that aquifer there. That was there before you came, and hopefully you're not coming around a tree. I'm coming through a tree. Um, so, so... So the water, the riparian environment is actually not nearly as prolific today as it was then. Just imagine if we had 8% water on our landscape today. Imagine what that would do to, um, to hydration, to make sure aquifers stayed up, wells stayed up, streams stayed up, springs stayed up. Um, transpiration into the atmosphere, clouds formed, better rain, uh, hydrologic spots for you know different plants and bulrushes and wildlife and uh, um, dragonflies and pollinators. Are you? Are, it, it's, it's, it's just mind-boggling. Okay, and so so we want to. We don't want to deplete the commons. We want, as a result of our lifetime here, we want there to be more commons. Yeah. More come. That, that's the idea. More abundance. Okay. Um, this is a water buggy uh, for you farmers that are here. If you got a pretty big outfit, uh, this is a water buggy for 800 cows. Uh, so we run about 1,000 head. Uh, they're not all kids. That's all of them. It's not, not that many cows. It's a lot of cows, but it's a lot of calves, yearlings, all that. Because we're, as Don said, we're, we're, we take everything clear to slaughter. Okay. So, so we have... Uh, different styles, but anyway, this this is this is a, a water buggy. The beauty of this this will water 800 cows at a, at a time, uh, 16 head at a time. You need you need to, when you're doing this clumping, this mobbing, uh, you need enough water area for two percent of the herd. So if you've got 100 head, you need to be able to have two at a time. 200 head, four at a time. 300 heads. Are you with me? 600. Um, and so so this is enough for 800. The beauty of this is you don't have to dump the water out to move them. So when you move the cows, uh, it doesn't dump out. So you've got nurse tanks up on top that plug into that underground uh, water line that feeds the nurse tank, but it does mean that if a bunch of cows come and hit this fast, you've got 700 gallons that can just flush down and you've got a ballast there. Everybody follow that? Okay. So this is the kind of very simple, simple infrastructure to be able to do large herds. Shade becomes an issue. So one of the first things that Dad ever did back in the 60s was build this 1,000 square foot portable loafing shelter so we didn't have to lose all our manure and concentrate it under trees. 
and so the cows could be comfortable with a basically a portable a, a, a portable tree. Um, so today now, with so much, we, we rent several properties, and we can't take that big thing down the road. So we've now made uh, using hay wagon chassis. We've made um, shelters that that we can hook together. We can hook four of these together, 60 cows under each one. These are big enough for 240 head, and they allow us to actually place the manure and urine exactly. We can put it on brambles, rocks. We can place it exactly where we want it on a, on a thin hillside. And the cows, of course, crowd right under there. And we get five years of residual fertility as a result of this. Okay. University of Kentucky get, did a study a couple of years ago on shade for cows in the summer. And what they found was that the average stalker calf will, if he's if he's come, if he's got shade on a on a hot day, will gain an additional 0.8 pounds a day. 0.8 pounds a day. Okay. Um, so you know it, it's it's financially tremendous uh, beyond just the comfort, the, the the fertility, all that. So yes, we build a lot of ponds. We fence them out. Okay, so the vegetation comes right up around the edge, and you can, you know, I drank some of that pond water today. Actually, I was starting a siphon on another pond, and I drank some. It helps, it helps your microbiome. Um, <laughs> but uh, I figure if the salamanders are in it, it's good enough for me. Okay, and uh, so, so this is the idea, and and just to give you, just to give you a a, a kind of a a ballpark idea of cost in this area okay I'm not that far away in this area essentially the excavation the excavation to build a pond is half a cent per gallon so a 500,000 gallon pond is going to cost you $2,500 okay you just see that half a, half a penny per gallon the beauty of a pond is I can walk out there anytime and see the water. A well, a uh, spring, you know, things, things can happen. They can go bad, they can quit, they can, you know, there's stuff going on down there in the dark depths, right? But a pond, not only is it a wonderful riparian area for wood ducks and geese and everything to come in on um, and grow frogs and things, but it also, uh, I can go out and measure and see it, okay? So this is at our place, and again, you can deliver this with a pump, you can deliver it however you want to. This is gravity, just showing the gravity. So we have, like I said, eight miles of water line. Uh, we can also use it for irrigation. Okay, so this is this is snow melt from January, okay? And this is the K-line system. Again, in the summer, in a drought, you never get more sun, but then you graze the grass off, and how many people in a drought graze the grass right onto the soil surface? Yeah. And that, that soil just bakes and bakes and bakes. Organic matter gets burned out. So we just start the water and we can maintain, again, that soft vegetative um, uh, ecology so that, when the, so that we can maintain the green material when the um, grass, when the rains do come. Uh, these are just simple real this is again this is uh, developed by the New Zealanders uh, very by by um, graziers for grazing in other words this is this is not for crops uh, this is designed for pasture based livestock systems uh, there is just fantastic and uh, so we, we're so thankful now we can get water so so in the, in the, the drought here so this is our field and this is the neighbor and you can see the difference um, with the with maintaining the green material, um, the vegetative growth. And that's all a part of the whole hydrology cycle to be able to maintain vegetative growth. P.A. Yeoman said the weak link on every farm, of course he was in Australia, he said the weak link on every farm is water because that's what stops the vegetation growth if you don't have enough of it. Um, so this is just a, a, another little shot of well, what, what can you do if you don't want to I mean, plowing is the worst thing we can do to the soil. So what if we don't want to plow? What if we want to grow something? So this is 
This is uh, Sudex. We have grown corn this way, uh, and cowpeas, but this particular one is Sudex. So uh, this is a system developed by an Australian named Colin Sice. He calls this pasture cropping. He's a small grain farmer in Australia. He's got now 2,000 farmers following this. It's going worldwide. This is, I think this is the next, it, it, this is gonna be as big as electric fence was. That's how big this is. Because it allows us to plant an annual into an existing sod without herbicide. So what we do is we graze it with the cows and then we no-till, no herbicide, no fertilizer, and then right before, in this case, the Sudex breaks ground, we graze it with the cows again. Now they're not happy because it hasn't really rested long enough to get very long. Okay, but one day of pain gives us many days of gain, okay? Uh, the marine motto, right? So, um, so that's, how, that's how we do this. And um, that's Daniel running down and put electric fence up so the cows can see it because it's so big that cows can't see it. Oh, no, he's just, he's just running a four-wheeler down through it to mash it over. Knock it over. No, just because knock it over. the fence will shock and it out. Next, okay, so, so you can see here, here's your electric fence. Okay, so here they are. This is where they've been today. And they're getting ready to go in over here. So 24 hours ago, this looked just like that. Okay? And this is a hundred head on a quarter acre. Okay? Put up the electric fence. That's our... Uh, and just to show underneath this crop, and again, this uh, Colin does barley and oats and wheat uh, this way. We haven't done that yet, but it's the same principle. You can see here the, the retarded grass. So this grass is retarded in the, in the shade of the annual, which was able to get up ahead of the grass that we, that we initially set back with the grazing. And you can see here the black, the, the earthworm castings um, all underneath here that have protected that soil. So here come the cows into the new break. <laughs> I'm trying to. There you go. And uh, yeah, that's a, that's a hundred head in a in a quarter acre, but you can't find them. <laughs> Come on here. Hey Jim, you want to flip it for? Him? There we go. There we go. So there, there's a hundred head in a quarter acre. <laughs> Where are they? Well, they're in there. And realize that this looked just like that 24 hours ago. How long it Look take, at that mulch. How long should it take to grow that? How long it take to grow that? Uh, that grew in about 65 days. But that's a hot tropical grass you planted in late May, June, July. So this is August, okay? And boom, you have all this wonderful carbohydrate forage for the animals, you know, getting um, tremendous cow days. Okay? <laughs> so I, I, think we'll, I think we'll stop right there. And, um, and 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 let me just take some uh, let me just take a moment to show you some of the tools of the trade here, um, and then we're going to go to questions and let you run the rest of the, the program. So so the bottom line of this, let me just explain this. The bottom line of this is that in um, in Augusta County where we are, which is not that different than Rockbridge for sure. The average cow days per acre, and a cow day is what one cow will eat in a day. So if we took if we took all the food that you eat today and put it on a plate and piled it up, that'd be one person day of food. With me? So in Augusta County, our average is 80 cow days per acre per year. So an acre will support 80 cows for one day a year. Thank you, Don. Or one cow for 80 days a year. Everybody follow the, the thing? Okay. okay. <clears throat> so what we've been getting now for the last 10 years is 400 cow days per acre. 400 cow days per acre. And again, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that humbly and appreciatively that, that, that these beautiful creator's designs work. Okay, and it's up to us to figure out how to incorporate them in our in our situation. So the, the beauty is that what I've shown you, 
Yes. Are there some costs? Yes. But listen, you know, we now we now lease about 10, 10 or 11 properties. We've been doing that for 25 years. And we have yet to go on to any piece of property. Doesn't matter how good it is or how bad it is, how big it is or how small it is. We have not gone into any property in the last 25 years in which in the very first year we doubled its production. Doubled it. The cost? About $50 average. The water system, the electric fence system, those are our two, those are the tools, okay? You put those in, go to daily moves, and suddenly you've doubled production. Now let me ask you something. If a one-time capital cost allows you to double production, what have you just done in essence? Made a lot of money. <laughs> no, not made a lot of money. It's like you've got more farms. Yes, you've got, thank you. You've bought land for 50 bucks an acre. Exactly. You've bought, you, has anybody bought land for 50 bucks an acre lately? I haven't seen it. So the point is, the point is, what, you know, the lesson for me, what we've learned is that, that rather than looking, you know, farm kids that want to stay on the farm too often grow up coveting the neighbor's place. You know, because if they want to stay on the farm, well, we got to grow, we got to get bigger. We got to grow this farm because there's not enough for two salaries. So we got to grow this farm. And so the kids grow up hoping that the neighbor's dad dies before his dad. You know, and that's not a very neighbor friendly way to grow up. Right. And so, and so one of the, one of the joys of this is that we're realizing that there's no end to the development that you can do in situ, that you can, that you can develop in situ. Nature is not a reluctant partner that we have to, uh, you know, get in a, in a, in a wrestling match and a tussle and, and force it, you know, I'm going to make you do it. You know. No, nature is a benevolent lover to be caressed. And it's our responsibility to find out where that is because nature wants to be abundant. And if it's not, we have done something to mess up that abundance. That, that's the point. And so, and so, so we, we've got, the, we've got the, the grazing, the pruning under control. All right, so then the next step is this irrigation. Then that, that tends to you into yet another, you know, development. And, and it just uh, goes on. Tools of the trade. Okay. Um, electric fence. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive. This is, um, this is, everybody knows what this is. This is one of those little uh, $4.99 um, extension cord reels from down at Lowe's. Right? You don't have to buy a $40, uh, you know, uh, reel. Uh, I find these last just about as long. The chances of dropping it and breaking it are about the same whether it costs $5 or 40 bucks. Okay? And um, this is a nifty handle here on this end. This, this is kind of a new thing that these guys developed. So it's a nifty handle. <clears throat> the, the, uh, I'll just show you some of this technology. So the, the, the wire ties on this little... A metal post here and this metal this little uh, wire runs all the way through and comes out here on the end but it's got two ways to hook up you can either hook it on the metal and bring spark from here to there or you can hook it up back here on this plastic and it's dead and, and, and the spark doesn't go on to wherever you hook it up see it's, it's a double yeah. double hand. okay so you know the, there is you're not gonna find that down at TSC Sorry, ain't gonna be there. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of cool technology out there. Um, but to, to use. will that keep like, you know, uh, you're talking mostly cows, but like lambs, you've got to have something all the way down, yeah. right? So it might it might take three three pieces of that. Okay, you won't do it with one, but maybe with three. In Tellerope, you get it from Premier, and it's got. Um, thread, it's got uh, steel threads woven through it, okay? But this here is, is I mean, we use this as boundary fence along the public road. This stuff is incredible. And uh, I found some wood to knock on. It has never failed us. It's only failed us twice when somebody actually shot it, okay? <laughs> yeah, it got in the way of a deer or something, you know, and somebody shot it. Uh, somebody shoots on a water line sometimes. Yeah, you just never know. But anyway, um, nobody being malicious, just you know, there's... A lot of bullets out there. Um, so, 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 so this, this, 
um, this is not nearly, of course, as cheap as this over here because there's you know, a lot more stuff in it. But this is strong. You can't break it. A deer certainly can't break it. And we've put this for, uh, I mean, it just, it, it's very visible. And it's just, it's just fabulous. Um, gra grass doesn't short that out. Is the point with that, right? The grass, the grass doesn't short it out. Uh, well, grass won't short it out, but the grass shorting it out is, is more to do with your energizer. Yeah. Okay, so this is an energizer. These are the new, um, these guys are, are fairly, these guys have just come out in the last, oh goodness, uh, five years. And the cost of these little solar panels is coming down, down, down. So it used to be that a deep marine battery was way, way cheaper than the solar panel. Well, now the solar panels are cheaper than the the marine battery because of the cost of solar panels have come down. So these are cool little units for, you know, 120, 30 bucks. Very, very powerful. This is a Premier One unit, IntelliShock. And uh, these things just last and last. And um, they're, just, they're just fantastic. Um, so we don't have a massive big energizer on a, on a whole farm grid. We just have a bunch of these and we put these around different places. So we're not running the whole thing at one time. You know, simple little gate handles. All of our permanent wires are aluminum. We don't use any steel. Uh, this is aluminum wire. This is a 12 and a half gauge aluminum wire. That's all of our permanent fencing, unless we're in a real tough situation where we use this. So we either use this or this uh, for permanent fencing. And the beauty of aluminum is that it's way lighter than steel and it never burnishes it never gets rusty um, the reason people have so much wildlife problems with electric fence is not because the deer all get in a in a conspiracy and let's, let, 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 let's see how many fences we can tear out for this guy you get wildlife problems because the wildlife can't see it but if it stays bright like aluminum on a moonlit night that it, it shines and they can see it and, and they don't go through it and so that's, our, and it conducts way better. And so we can build fence with no brace posts. We have no brace posts. <coughs> well, brace posts are the big, that's a big cost of fencing, all right? And so when you go with no brace posts, you Damn. just changes it. You know, simple little insulators, white knobs at the corners. Okay, water. Everybody knows about pipe. Don't have to talk too much about pipe. Pipe. It's good inventor. Okay. <laughs> Um, so these are specialty you, again you won't find you won't even find these at Lowe's you won't find these in any place they have to be special ordered but they are made so this is an inch and a quarter inline coupling with a garden with a um, not garden hose a, a three quarter inch um, SAE threaded plumbing threaded T okay you'll never find these at a plumbing store but they are made they're made in all different sizes you can get them inch and a half, inch and three. You can get them all different sizes, and um, and then and then we just get a little. Sorry. You just get the little you know neoprene nipple with SAE threads on one side and garden hose threads on the other. Stick that in, and then you put your little 99 cent valve on the top. And you have a, you have a T access from your from your main drag going into a garden hose, okay. And if you have decent pressure here, you know you can you can get um, almost 20 gallons a minute through this if you've got pretty good pressure. I mean that's a lot of water, 20 gallons, you know, 15 gallons, 10 gallons, and that's a lot of water, okay. So so those those are some of the, the specialty things. <clears throat> Again, you can um, this is a water meter. Many people have never actually seen one, but you can buy these. Again, this has come from the catalog. You won't find this at Lowe's. But it's a water meter, so you, you put it in one side, put it out the other, and you can put these on your legs, and it's wonderful for diagnosing if you have a leak. If everything's off and this little needle's still turning, there's a leak somewhere, okay? It's also great to know how much water you're using if you want to, you know, want to monitor your water. These things are not expensive. Um, you know, this thing is only... Um, Oh, I'm trying to think. It's less than hundred dollars. It's maybe uh, you know sixty, but but to, for what this will do, so you can actually find a leak, 
See what water you're using? No, these are these are real simple. I mean, again, I'm showing this not because I don't think anybody knows here knows that you don't have that there's not a water meter. I'm showing it to you because most of the time when you say a water meter, we think the municipal utility, somebody comes out and check most of us don't don't actually see, you know, see or, or see it out just where you can what do you mean you can buy it? I thought I thought the like the water company put it in, you know, the city puts them in. Well, you can get them. They get them from the same place you can get them from. Okay? Um, and then my favorite, of course, is the full flow, the full flow valve. This is the full flow valve. So this Gilly Wicker here. Okay. Crank it down here. So you've got your trough. You want your water trough, you stick this through the, it's already got a washer and a rubber or washer here, okay? So you just stick this through. This happens to be a one inch, all right? So that's big. You put a one inch uh, thing on here. And, um, and then as the water fills, okay, the ball floats. When the ball floats, when the ball floats, this little plunger here, see, it just goes, in and out. See that go in and out? So it's got it's it's a it's a huge it's a huge needle valve the size of this whole orifice. Are you with me? And that's why this thing and so that's the only there's no spring, there's nothing. These things we run them for years and years and years and they just never break. They never clog up, they never get gunk in them, they never break. Um, the guy we get these from lives up in uh, Michigan. And he pinched the the uh, the actual mechanisms off of the automatic garden sprinklers, uh, uh, golf course sprinklers in Florida. He had a brother lived in Florida, and was interested in how they worked. So he saw this and man, I'm gonna make those for cattle. And again, you're not gonna find these, you know, at, at any hardware store. They're specialty stuff. But I, that's why I wanted to show it to you to real to see what kind of stuff is out there. And trust me. There's not a government agent out there that will introduce you to this stuff. Okay, they want you to they want you to you know sign a contract with them so they can get you know credit for so many acres of whatever, but they're not going to show you this kind of stuff. So let's go to questions. What's on your What's on your mind? I hope I've stimulated something. Yeah. Yes. Hey, uh, I liked your comparison about the diaper, the teenager, yeah. and the nursing home. If we could just prune ourselves. To stay be a teenager. Oh, that's right. If we can just print ourselves, we can stay a teenager too. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. So that's right. Done work what, what, what are you going to cut first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still think of myself as a teenager, so maybe it'll. Yeah, be. that's right. That's but right. you're you're saying that the, the the herbivore or the grazing herbivore was keeping it in that high growth period you call the teenage period. Right. And I was wondering, but you also said that you know cutting the grass would do that too. Although if it depends on what you do with the grass as to whether it builds up the soil. And then the other, I was wanting you to compare grazing with uh, mowing and also if you took the material and composted it as opposed to grazing. Okay, well there's a lot of pieces to your, uh, <laughs> of a lot of pieces to your question there. So let, let, me, let me kind of take it a little piece at a time. So the mechanical cutting is in the spring, in the spring, everything tends to grow real, real fast. And so typically, if you don't have more cows than you can keep through the winter, you don't have enough cows to graze all the grass in the spring because there's because it grows so much, all right? And so what are you going to do with that excess grass? Are you just going to let it turn brown and quit? Or do you mechanically harvest it, make hay for winter protection? When the grass isn't growing, and restart the t the teenage growth cycle. All right, so that's what we do to restart the So so making the hay is as much planning for winter as it is to prune to restart because we can't get around with the cows fast enough. All right, now what are we going to do with that hay? So um, what we do is we feed under an awning. So don't call it a barn. There's no sides. It's just an awning shed, all right? 
And but the awning protects the winter manure and urine from leaching. Okay. We add wood chips primarily. So we we take crooked, diseased, junk trees, fence rows, whatever, <coughs> clean chip. That goes in as what we call a carbonaceous diaper. Yeah. Compost. Okay. And that absorbs the manure and urine. As we build it, so it, it builds, builds, builds. As we build it, we add corn to it. The corn ferments in the anaerobic bedding pack because the heavy cows are tromping out the oxygen, so it's actually fermenting. The corn ferments. When the cows come out in the spring to graze, we put the pigs in. Pigs then seek the fermented corn, aerate it, which we call them piggerators. They inject the oxygen and convert it from anaerobic to aerobic compost, and that's the heart and soul of our fertility program. Wow. Okay. So again, it's an integrated approach of integrating the forest with the open land. And the beauty of using a lot of wood in the, pe in, in the fertility program is open land becomes starved for fungi. Soil is much more uh, fertile if it has both bacteria and fungi. Open land tends toward bacteria. Forest land tends toward fungi. And so by using a lot of wood as our fertility, we're able to stimulate fungi in the open land, and that stimulates an additional level of fertility. Okay? Good. Wow. Yeah, Don? Could you describe for us how you might fix out a creek? So that animals would have access to drink but not wade in and dig ah. in the water. Great. Okay. So so um, so many times we want the cows to be able to drink water out of a creek or even a pond or something, some sort of little stream, but we don't want to give unlimited access. So the first the first thing is that as I've showed by controlling them this way, look. Let's all be honest. 400 years ago, the bison ran through our rivers. Okay? But they didn't stay in the same part of the river all day, every day. Are you with me? Yeah. Big difference. Um, and and so, so limited access is acceptable if it's very occasional. So you don't denude the banks of the river or the creek. So if you have a lot of vegetation and the cows have access to it once in a blue moon, that's one thing, okay? The second thing is you can make a V. So we've done this uh, uh, numerous places. So there's a, there's a rule, there's a, psychological, um, there's a psychological stress point. A cow uh, does not want to get up close to an electric fence because they might lose their footing a bigger one might come up and, and you know and and hit them they're aware of all this okay and so they want to stay a foot or 18 inches away from an electric fence they don't want to go up near to it lest they accidentally touch it all right and so um, so there's there's a there's a, um, a a closeness there's a proximate stress point at which a cow doesn't want to go so what we do is, if we've got a stream or a pond or something, we simply put, we simply run a V, a little V in there, um, and you can put a post over here or in a creek, you can, you can um, anchor it to the other side of the creek, you know, if it's a real narrow creek. The point is that if you make that V eight feet, the cow will never feel comfortable lounging there because the wire is too close for them to, to settle down. That they will not settle down, okay? And so we make these Vs eight feet. They come in and they drink. So you, you give them access here. They can stand. They can drink. But because of the V, they're not going to actually go in and turn clear around because now they're in the point of the V and they might get whacked. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And so they want to go in on the wide part of the V, get their drink, and then back up, turn around, and leave. Okay, and so there's a tremendous amount of psychology in in the in the precision of the placement, so that they don't want to lounge in the creek. 
But yes. do you have problem with um, flooding taking out your V's? Flooding taking out the V's. Occasionally, yes. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, yes. But you know what? It's a whole lot easier just to replace a little single one strand of, of fence, you know. And, and, and often we have, a, we have what we call a trapeze. Because a lot of times if you're, if you're going from this bank to that bank in a V, you know, let's say you have a, a, six, a six foot wide creek, okay, you know. This chair to that chair, six feet wide, not very wide. Well, the thing is, you've got a post up here on the bank. You've got a post over here, and um, and, and you've made a V. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Like this? Okay. Well, the problem is the wire in the middle of the creek, because the creek is down, the wire might be five feet high right here. Well, then it can walk right under it. Okay. So what we do is, is what we call a trapeze. So you anchor the wire on this post, this post, and then you hang a, a just a junk metal, anything junk metal here in the middle yeah. so that it actually conforms to the U of the creek bed. And you know, this, this doesn't have to be close to the water, it can be 24 inches, but in a flood, it might knock that out. And what it'll do, it'll break over here and you just, and you come up after the flood and there's your trapeze lying along the bank, and you just take it and you connect it back up over here. Well, I've just heard arguments that, you know, um, fencing for, fencing, fencing cows out, that um, the floods could be cost prohibitive, that, you know, can, you'd have to rebuild fence. Right. Well, uh, again, th this fence is so cheap yeah. and so easy. Mm -hmm. That that uh, that even a complete rebuild is almost nothing. The other thing is that because it's only one wire and it's not a woven wire, it's not some big. It doesn't collect debris. Okay, if if you put if you put a multi strand or a, a, a web wire uh, or even goodness even a board fence, you know, and hang it, mm -hmm. then everything that comes down here, a branch whatever is going to grab it and then you're going to get a push but with a single strand stuff tends to go under it and nothing catches because it's just it's just one wire thank you okay and the wire that we put along the river along the creek and the river or around the pond um, can be fairly close to the bank um, again be, for the same reason and of course, the river has to really flood to get clear up to the bank and then clear up to the electric fence. So usually you don't have any problems with the ones alongside it, again, because it's one wire, but you do once in a while lose the, lose the little trapeze. Great. Yes. So are you saying that you can have your cattle go into the surface water if there are bees and they can't turn around, they have to sort of back out, and it results in clean water? Does it result in clean? Well, let's put it, 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 it doesn't soil the water. It doesn't, it doesn't destroy the water. Uh, there's actually a guy in, um, where does he live? Toward Lynchburg. He's actually done a bunch of monitoring with, I think, the NRCS. And he's actually done a lot more access than I'm talking about. But he, but what he's done is he's, he's actually um, giving them pieces of, of the creek banks and but but it's 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 not often and he's actually measured contamination from upriver and below his place the bottom line is that over now this five-year test period uh, even though he's giving very limited access he's got so much vegetation now on the banks because the cows stimulate again not every day but three days a year maybe four days a year for one day only. We're, trying, we're mimicking a, a buffalo herd, okay? That actually stimulates grass and vegetation right up to the, to the creek bank, okay. using animals as, a, as kind of a landscaper, you know, as a, a massage. So these cows have to have an alternate source of water on a regular basis? Uh, no. well, well, hours? They're only going in three days a year. They need oh. to be in yeah. No, 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 no. They're, they're three days a year in a, in a single spot. 
So today they're here, tomorrow they're here, the next day they're here, the next day they're here. And so he's giving them access along the river for 50 days in 50 different increments. Are you with me? That's completely different than 50 days at the same spot. Very, very different. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a time. And with the additional green vegetation that you have, have you seen a reduction, I guess, in... Oh, great question. Yeah, we've seen a reduction in water with the amount of green vegetation we have. I, I haven't measured it. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. Is there any benefit to the cattle from limiting access? Any benefit to the cattle from limiting access to the water? Uh, to the well, to the, to the cattle's health because of... You know, the yes. possibly being cleaner as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, 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 so clean water, yeah, I mean, clean water is, is a huge thing. That's why we, you know, we make sure that our ponds are fenced out uh, because, yeah, uh, clean, clean water is very much a limiting factor. I mean, not only for parasites, but also just uh, pathogen load on the liver. You know, all the, the kidneys in the liver, everything that's, that's there to try to, whatever, filter and clean the body uh, becomes an issue if you, um, if you if you have bad water. So yes, I mean animals. You know, we we could argue. Well, they're not quite. Uh, they certainly aren't quite as picky as humans are, or, or maybe as susceptible to things. But uh, I don't know. They're not far behind. And so so generally, we want we want to, to give the cows and chickens and pigs or whatever water uh, that that we would. Be willing to drink. Have you noticed any difference in your veterinarian bills from uh, doing that? <laughs> we don't have veterinarian bills. <laughs> I mean, we, we don't. We, we, we literally, I mean, if we, if we didn't have a dog or a cat, um, we wouldn't have any vet bills. Uh, it's, it's the dog and the cat to take the vet bills. And I mean, and this goes on years and years and years. And we have, you know, tens of thousands of animals and we just, we just don't have vet bills. That's, and I don't have anything against vets. I'm not. I'm not opposed to vets, uh, but but we we just don't have have those. Yes. So here's a leading question: Is your farm profitable? Is our farm profitable? Uh, yes, that's a short answer. I, I, I don't. Is it profitable compared to Augusta Farms and area farms? Yes, uh, I, I would say far more profitable. Um, so. Uh, right now, the average American farm, average, it takes four dollars worth of depreciable infrastructure, that's buildings and equipment, to generate a dollar in gross sales. So a farm that's grossing a hundred thousand dollars a year will have four hundred thousand in equipment, buildings, depreciable infrastructure. That's that's the average in in America right now. We are running fifty cents. Of infrastructure to a dollar and, and, and I'm including our delivery trucks everything okay um, that's a pretty big difference it's, it's a difference in capital to you know to, to that now where do we lose it you know what, what's the what's the weak link well the weak link is we substitute extra labor so we substitute people for some of this capital all right you can argue well that's real-time dollars that's true um, but we don't apologize for repopulating the countryside. We think we think the repopulating the countryside is a good thing. Uh, keeping the local diners, you know, not not uh, whatever, having to fly over country. We, we think that bringing people back to the land is actually a, a benefit. And so we don't apologize for needing a few more people. We have strategically said we will do this with more people, and we won't need any farm drugs. We won't have vet bills. We won't uh, have concrete, and we won't have fans, and you know, da, 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 all, all the other things, the chemicals and the things. When you say you the cost of the people is baked into your profitability. Yes, the cost of the people is baked into the, the, to the profitability. Yes, it absolutely is. What's yes. the typical salary of your full-time farm hand? Uh, uh, our typical salary is uh, running uh, 38 thousand over 35 and we've had several of our guys um, get uh, up over 40 we don't have any hourly employees okay um, we don't have any hourly employees 
all uh, we either use subcontract or salary with a bonus uh, with with a self a self incentivized bonus place. You know, you've got autonomy right here. You can you know if you want to do this, do it, and that'll be your you know you can adjust your like like our, our apprentice manager Eric. He's on a salary, but he also on his own in the spring. He does about 100 maple tree taps, and on a good year, he sells, I don't know, 10, 20, 12,000 dollars worth of maple syrup. Uh, that's his little, that's his side gig, right? Uh, but he's totally, in, you know, he does that on his own. He's, it's, we're perfectly fine, and we give him time off to do it. That sort of thing. And he's your apprentice manager. He's our apprentice manager. Yes. Yes. So you've got apprentices. Yes, we do. We do. And they and and their package. Is the apprentices? Their package is right at thirty thousand. Okay, but they're apprentices. They're not. They're not staff. They're not. You know, full time. They're they're apprentices. They're they're learning as they go. Yes. Um. So for the day to day labor, how much are you depending on the apprenticeships as opposed to full time employees? And I'm asking because as a farmer, it's incredibly difficult to find farm labor to find those employees um, to do the day to day it's a dirty job. Yeah. Okay. The question is on on the labor. All right. So I said that our our staff people, our full time people, you know, they're in the thirty five to forty range. And percentage wise, how much? Okay. And and yeah. And, and so so percentage of the work uh, of the actual work uh, staff would be I'm going to say seventy percent. And now now apprentices get a good salary too. All right, I said they're, they're 30 and they're apprentices. So it's the five month, it's the five month uh, stewards, May 1 to September 30, that's our heavy season. They do not get a lot of pay, but, but we have an on farm chef who presents a $10 a plate meal for everybody, every supper, okay? So the point is, uh, and, and we have that we have housing for them. Uh, we give them their food. We give them an education worth thirty thousand dollars. We've articulated this. The value is there, okay? And anyone who thinks, any, let I me mean, just say this: anyone who thinks interns or apprentices are cheap labor has not had one. <laughs> <laughs> has not had one. If, you, if I start telling you the thousands of dollars, total pickups, run through utility poles, oopses, uh, the, the four-wheeler the four submerged in the pond because the brake wasn't, I mean, I can go on all night, okay? Many times we realized we would be better financially to not do the intern apprentice program, but we are committed to germinating new young farmers. Our heart's in it. We love it. And we put a lot of time and attention on it. You know, we, we, uh, we do formal lectures. We take them uh, on, on field trips. When uh, the South Pole Association met last summer, uh, we took them all to the South Pole thing. We, we pay their entry fee. At, you know, a lot goes into it. No, not not, 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 not the least of which is two weeks ago, or four weeks ago, when we did the two-week checkout. So we had 40 of them come to check out to be next year's next year's crew group. We ran to Charlottesville Airport 25 times, <laughs> picking them up and taking them back. Okay. But is that the answer to the labor shortage? Are you saying no? No, that's not. That, that, it, is a, is it, it is an answer. It, yeah. It's part of the mix. I would say it's part of the mix. Yeah. Okay. And and what that mix is for you, I don't know. But the fact is, we've got to get. Our expenses, our capital down. Listen, farmers say, well, I can't move cows. It takes too much time. Listen, the average farmer with cows during the calving season spends half a day, every single day, running around their fields looking for cows. I can see mine in two minutes. They're all in a group. If I want to get them in, if I want to get them in, I'm going to have to run around all day with a four-wheeler trying to find them behind the brush. I just call them, step aside, they run in the gate, a corral, and I close the gate. What's that worth? 
Listen, I, we've done this every side of the way since Sunday. All right, my return to labor on moving cows every day is 100 bucks an hour. I can work for 100 bucks an hour because that is the additional production. When you move from 80 cow days an acre, think about it. We're averaging 0.9 acres per cow. 0.9 acres per cow. If you have a 200 acre pasture, imagine what it would do to go from 50 cows to 200 cows without one additional increase in tractor or overhead. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Because the farmer's big equity is tied up in land. Okay, so if you can if you can massage abundance out of your land without exploiting it, okay, it's a big deal. Okay, All right. You you not going to let me go, are you? Can... I mean, we're talking about capital. If it's a new farmer trying to get into the business, yes, you've got to have the land. Well, you don't. How is that possible? You don't. don't have the land. You don't, okay? Yeah. So the beauty, I didn't show you all the other things, you know, the poultry and the pigs and the turkeys and all this stuff, but I want you to appreciate how little infrastructure you saw in those pictures, okay? So we don't brag about tractors and barns and fences and any of the, the stuff, okay? We like to brag about how much stuff we don't have, okay? And the beauty of this is that the equity is in, is in knowledge, and skill and customers. That's where our equity is. It's not in land. So we so we can do we and we do. We, we rent, you know, ten places and we place all this stuff on rental land that we don't own because the cost is so high. Why would we buy it when you can rent it for you know half a percent on the on the market dollar? Okay. So so we rent it, but the beauty of this is our turkey, our turkey structures are mobile. Even our brooders are mobile. Our broiler structures are mobile. Our pig structures are mobile. Our turkey structures, the cow shade mobiles are mobile. Um, everything is mobile, and what that means is we can actually build a farm business without owning the land. And we have many, we have our interns and apprentices who have gone through the program and left, and I mean, many of them don't go into farming, that's fine. But several of them, the ones who have, amazingly, young people, no money, no equity, no nothing, but they get on to a piece of land with mobile infrastructure and can either build a second business on an existing farm with portable infrastructure, or we even had one, one couple uh, start farming full time, I mean, right out of the gate on, on a, a conservation easement in uh, Petaluma, in uh, San Francisco, California. Um, but it be, because it was all mobile infrastructure, if things went south and the agreement broke down, they could put their farm on a low boy and move it up the road to another place. That really, when you take the land ownership out of the equation, it fundamentally changes the way in. Okay? See, the problem is when it's so hard to get when it's, when it's hard for young people to get in, it's hard for old people to get out. Exactly. And so what we have is we have both, we have one generation looking for an entrance ramp, another one looking for an exit ramp, and they're stuck because of this land cost thing. So, so I'm a huge believer in, um, and, and you know, in, my my latest book, you know, your successful farm business. Um, I talk about that a lot in how to have a farm and not own the land. Okay, yeah. So I think that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have three questions, but in a different. Your solar charger does that hold power at night? The whole power at night? Yes, it'll hold power for a week. Okay. Hold power a long time. And there's the, the, battery. And yeah, it does. It does. It's all self-contained. A lot of technology there, all self-contained. Okay. Second question. From the photographs that you showed us tonight, how do you keep your water lines from freezing when you're infrastructure? How do you keep the water lines from freezing? They're buried. Okay. They're buried. That's what that 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 uh, access port was. So when you cycle your animals from one pasture to the next, do you drain that tub in the wintertime or no? Oh, oh, well the tub is totally portable. It moves with the cows, all right? Okay. So the last few nights where it's been real cold, sure. so what we do there 
is we take that tub and we stick a we stick a garden hose in it with a piece of with, with a with a metal anchor on the end so it'll stay in the bottom and just run it out here 30 feet pull a siphon on it right. and let it run overnight in the morning we go up and pull it out and it's fine okay. it's, it's, so that cycles the water through and we run it you know not where the cows are across the fence you know down in a low spot right. and uh and it runs away from the cows and that and that cycle is and obviously you know the, the colder it is the harder the harder you have to run it okay and if it gets to zero you might not even be able to to make it run hard enough okay but fortunately in the winter you normally have plenty of water that's when you have plenty of water so you can waste water in the winter that you might not waste in the summer okay okay and my third question is, is uh, i realize that this question has to do with scale but what is your time period from the time that it, your, your cattle and whatever else you do on your rotational pasturing comes all the way back to pasture number one so yeah okay so how long is the, the rest period when right. you come back that is completely uh, regulated by how fast the grass is growing. So, so obviously, it slows down in August and in the dormant well, what, what, we're, what, we, what we graze today, we won't graze until grass grows back in the spring. But in the spring, the rest period might be 40 days, okay. you know, if it's growing real fast. So, so the rest period uh, uh, ebbs and flows based on how fast the recovery is. Okay? okay? Great. Um, so I just want to let you know, real quick, it's 714. Yeah. I don't know if y'all have to get on the road, but I know there are no. some other questions. We're, we're okay. I'm happy to stay another five minutes if people want to continue to ask questions. Are we okay? I mean, I know people have places to go. I don't want to no, overstay the welcome. You know, no, we're, we're fine. We're fine. Teresa said I, I can stay out late tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we're okay. Yes, way in the back. Yes, sir. Where do you measure 8% full organic matter? Where do you measure it or how? Oh, where? Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's it's in the top eight inches of, of soil. Maybe of well, I mean the soil tester goes down what eighteen inches. You know the probe. Um, so you know you can you can go down eighteen inches. I, I didn't take the last test, so I don't know how far down he went. But he went you know however far the probe can go down. Yeah, that that's an interesting question because we have. I didn't, you know, preface all this with, with our, our history. When we came to the farm in 61, we did not have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. So Dad poured concrete and used car tires, pushed a half-inch pipe down in them, and when we built an electric fence, we, we, he'd pile these uh, concrete tires up on a tractor platform, drive real slow, and my brother and I, you know, we were just little kids, but the two of us could get on the edge of this uh, concrete tire and heave it off, and then Dad would go along and stick electric fence stakes in it because we didn't have enough. We, we were rock. And today, all those rocks have 14 inches of soil on them. Okay? Now, it's not, it's not five feet like it was before the Europeans came and turned everything upside down, but it's, it's 14 inches more than it was 60 years ago, so that's pretty cool. Another question, yes. So I know some people that I wish were here and they're not. So mm -hmm. what's the best way that they could hear a lot of what you've had to say tonight? I know you've got books. You also have YouTube videos or videos. You're farming and you're going out and trying to teach people how to farm. So what's a good way to tap into your... What's a good way to tap into us? YouTube. Well, for starters. You know. For starters, YouTube. Right. And, and, and I mean, uh, if they're readers, um, you know... Salad Bar Beef, this book here, has everything in it that I talked about tonight in pictures. Okay. Okay. Well, so, I, I do a daily blog. Yes, well, almost every day. I try to do it every day, but not every day. Um, but but I'm not generally talking about this really, really how-to stuff. You know, it's, it's more. The video that I'm recording should be shown, um, should be able to be accessed through YouTube on, through Rack. Okay, there you go. There's, there's yeah. yeah, that's. That's real time. That's current. There you go. What's your Michigan source for your valve? Michigan source for the valve, the valve is um, Neville, Neville Supply. Don Neville is his name. He just makes them in his garage and ships them all over the world. They're fantastic. Yes. I just want to say I've had a little bit better experience, I think, with the NRCS than you have. Uh -huh. uh, they have done a lot of help on my farm of 80 acres, 14 cows, 30 sheep, and no tractor. Uh -huh. uh, but I'm sorry, in terms of supporting rotational grazing, stream exclusion, all that, 
I could not have done what I needed to do on my farm before I was dead uh, without their support. And I think, I, I don't want to say they're coming around, but I'm telling you, I've, I've got a lot of really good support for them. Talking a lot about, a lot about the same things that you do. So um, they are very supportive, um, but you, you do have to tell them what you want. And uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily just buy everything Mark Stock and Barrel. <coughs> All right. Well, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I, I, will, I will tell you that they do not like portable systems. They want to put in stationary systems. Well, stationary um, water. I second what he said. They paid for. I mean, I wouldn't have water. I wouldn't be rotationally grazing. Oh, right people, now. don't say you no. wouldn't have it. If, don't, 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 okay. don't. Well, we don't. That, 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 you just though. become a victim. You've just said I couldn't. Correct. I couldn't be responsible unless the government did this. I, I have been rotationally grazing because waters just came on le le online last week. I've been rotationally grazing for eight months through the winter uh -huh. through the summer. It took me an hour and a half every single day to haul the water. Right. I was oh, you, you can't. You can't haul water. Right. You no, can't. I had, it was the only way. There, there's no water on the place. I had to haul the water. And the recovery of that time, I'm telling you, yeah. I've, I've gained my sanity back in the last two weeks. <laughs> that's, that's fabulous. I'm just telling you, whenever somebody says the only way was the government, it's no, not true. It was. I'm just, I'm just telling you, whenever somebody says the only way is the government, it's not. I don't believe it. So anyway, we, we haven't. We've put in eight miles. Of inch and a quarter. Well, I mean, we have spent. We, we go on to rented land and spend thousands of dollars doing this. No government, and we've done a bunch of places where NRCS did systems, and they do not work. They will not work because they can't deliver the volume of water to a place. I mean, we we rent one four hundred pl acre place. Lady spent. I mean, it, it was it was a two hundred thousand dollar NRCS project. They ran out of water the very first year. We went in and put in a pond. And we've got 15 gallon a minute water a mile away for for a, a tenth the price. I'm just telling you, just telling you. Yeah, so I mean, one question to that is, how would you advise? You know, someone's trying to get into farm. So one of your interns, right. I mean, would you advise? It sounds like you want to uh, try to lease land rather mm -hmm. than owning because it'll go broke. I mean, would you advise people to have another job and just kind of do it on the side because the economics. <laughs> I mean, it's tough to try oh, to yeah. get into it. If it was oh, yeah. for my mother-in-law and some other things, I wouldn't have any land. Absolutely. Listen, listen. I stand on the shoulders of of generations. I mean, mom and dad. Mom and dad worked off the farm to pay for it, so that when Teresa and I got married in 1980, it was not a business. It was just land, but we didn't have to pay for it. So I'm very appreciative of of whatever whatever uh, wealth accumulation a family can create to give a running start. I'm okay. We're, we're good there. Um, so, so, you know, my advice is to always start and do everything you can now. So you get experience. You can't Google experience. The most important <laughs> equity you can have is experience. Okay. So you start getting some experience. You move forward with that. On, on, and, and you don't go on a Caribbean cruise. You don't go out to eat. You don't go to the theater. You throw your TV out in the junk heap. Yes. Uh, okay? All right. My point is, do you want this or not? If you want it, it's everything. Everything. Okay? Then, once you've accumulated enough experience to have some confidence, and perhaps a one or two year nest egg, then you jump off the cliff. You make your break. What's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is you run through your nest egg, your burn rate's too high, and you, and you have to go work again somewhere. But I'm all for jumping off the cliff if you have a nest egg and some confidence. But if you don't have any experience and you don't have a nest egg, you'll ruin your marriage if you jump off a cliff. Okay? All right. One more, we're going to quit. Yes. Did you, did you build your ponds in the proximity of a spring? Did we build our ponds in the proximity of a spring? No. Most of them are simply built, literally, using this formula of a, of a, of a watershed. You can go up, again, a, a, a five-acre um, watershed is, is not much. It's very small. So we just go in. 
to a, to a valley that's, you know, it's going to funnel water. All right. We look at the watershed and remember a valley, a valley undulates. A valley is the land never lies in just a linear a, a line. It, it it goes in steps. All right. So when you put your dam in, you're looking for the, you're looking for one of these steps because over the centuries the water has slowed down at that step and dropped silt, and that's what you're looking for. Not only that, but you're looking for that shelf. So when you put your 12 foot dam in, it's going to dam up way more water than if it's steeper. Are you with me? Because the water is gonna, the water isn't gonna I'm go over the terrain. I'm just trying to get my head around all yeah. the rocks. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. Yeah. You. you uh, and, and if your pond leaks, you can put pigs in there, and pigs we call them squealer sealers, and they'll seal it up. Okay. We've had ponds that wouldn't hold eight inches of water, put pigs in for two weeks, never leaked another drop. Okay. So the the pig, pigs can make sand hold water. I mean, they get in there. <laughs> I mean, they get in there, and they—I mean, they are unbelievable. Okay, and so, so there, there's a there's a lot of ways to do this. Okay, great. Listen, you guys have really been wonderful. Thank you, thank you, even for the challenging uh, questions. And and my only my only reason for being here is to encourage, inspire, and realize. There are a whole lot of alternatives that most of us don't hear about. And so I've learned for me, my weak link is usually not money or resources. The weak link is, is being touched by a different enough idea to spark my imagination. As, as, as Daniel, our son, says, he says, my, our problem is constipation of imagination <laughs> and so it takes often the lunatic fringe the weirdo the, the whatever right to bring to us a message that's imaginative enough okay to actually pump through it and that's my only desire and i want all of you to be successful and happy thank you thank you thank you Um, it's uh, sponsored by the Farm Bureau and the Virginia Cooperative Extension. It's called Showcasing Agricultural Stewardship in Rockbridge County, Reaching for Water Quality Goals While Confronting Economic Realities. It is Thursday, January 16th, to, to, 2020, 7 p.m. Um, I plan to be there. It's at the Board of Supervisors uh, meeting room.